So we will go ahead and start. Uh, anyways, this is uh, solar exploitation on a global scale, rise and fall of the control protocol. Uh, focus of this talk is analyzing the carrier mandated remote control and management functionality. Uh, pretty much, carriers are inserting some interesting different functionality into phones and we are gonna discuss what we've found in it, the security issues, different vulnerabilities, and try to demonstrate how over the air code execution can be obtained on what we're estimating to be close to two billion devices. Uh, who we are, um, I'm Matthew Solonek, uh, we both are researcher, or security scientists at uh, Acumont Labs. This is Mark Blanchu. Uh, how the research began. So, uh, what was it? A little bit late last year, I was doing something I don't really know many people do. I was actually reading a manual for a little MTEM device. And in there, it said, if you've got these devices already deployed in field, and you forgot to turn on remote uh, control, more or less, remote console on your little MTAM, please call your manufacturer and carrier and they can turn it on. I was like, what? Uh, and that started me down a road that is landing up here. So we will start with the rise of the control protocol. Uh, we're going to go into the, an overview of carrier controls. So, current standard, OMA device management. It's an amalgamation of prior standards which have been used, such as like OMA CP and OMA SP. Um, there was actually a talk in Black Hat 2009 on OMA CP called uh, Hijacking Mobile Data Connections. Good talk, definitely recommend checking it out. Um, this new protocol though is now currently deployed on over two billion devices according to stats we found online. Um, it's an interesting client. More or less the carriers define the requirements of it. If they want it to do X or Y, they give that to the manufacturers. The manufacturers then implement whatever the requirements they ask for. Uh, so sometimes it's very minor, you know, just real basic stuff. Sometimes a little bit more. And each implementation is different, sort of. So in OMA device management, we have what are called management objects, which provide different feature sets. You know, the carriers will say, I want X, Y, or Z or all of the above. You know, some of the interesting ones <clears throat> we've seen are FUMO, you know, standard firmware over the air management. Uh, if any of y'all run Androids, especially if you're running them via a carrier provided device, say you bought your device from any of the major US or worldwide carriers, and you do a photo update. If it's not going over Goda, uh, Google's OTA, which most aren't, it is probably going over OMADM. Then we also have things like Conmo, which is pretty standard, allows the carriers to remotely reconfigure, you know, basic network settings, things like APNs, all the, you know, weird carrier stuff. But there are some interesting parts in that. Uh, then we start to get into a little bit more interesting feature sets. Llamo. So Llamo provides remote lock wipe factory reset capability. What that really means is that new standard in 2015, that has to be all phones have remote lock capability. Looks like this was gonna be it. Uh, DCMO, Diagmon, SCOMO. Talk a little bit more about those later. So we're gonna go into a little bit on device and client information. Current devices with OMADM that we have found. iOS, iOS has it on Sprint only, um, Android. In the US, most major carriers. We can guarantee three out of four usually have it. 
so if any of y'all have a major carrier device from uh, this list, please make sure it is turned off. We are running live base stations. Uh, Blackberry, Windows Mobile, we'll talk a little bit about that later. So it's also in hotspots, laptops, MTEM, and IoT basebands. It's an interesting spot because they are now trying to standardize on OMADM and an OMADM derivative to be the new device management standard for IoT and MTEM devices, which we like because it includes cars. So, embedded client locations. We're going to talk about where the code actually runs. So, pretty much on phones, this code lives in user land, mostly. So, we have a component that's living in user land, usually has a direct to baseband interface, though, like privileged, much higher than any standard app would usually have. On embedded MTEM devices, the code actually runs directly in the baseband. You know, we've got a carrier controlled piece of code running directly in your baseband. Now, other devices, it really depends on kind of where everything is. You know, I've seen it on hotspots where it's in the baseband, I've seen it where it's in user land, some mixes, partially. Can't quite tell. So, let's give a little bit of a history lesson, reference toolkit. Uh, most OMADE devices, or uh, clients, are actually built on what's called the SyncML Reference Toolkit. Uh, it's an open source toolkit. It was originally meant to be a proof of concept released by the SyncML OMADE uh, what, back in like 2003, 2004. Uh, it's pretty much the core code base for all of the clients we have found and it was last updated in 2004. So if y'all's devices are running it, there are some tweaks, but it's kind of interesting. And one more thing. We found one vendor is the primary vendor of nearly all OME clients in the world, between 70 and 90% market share. Redbend software. Redbend VDirect Mobile, OMA DM client. It's based on the SyncML toolkit, just like we talked about earlier. It's pretty much provided as a binary blob to all manufacturers for the most part. That includes baseband manufacturers. Uh, in other words, they do not know exactly what they're getting. And we found that kind of interesting. So, uh, a couple of things to note for later, there are two primary release versions, V4 and V5. Um, both are still heavily used and not sure the reasoning for the choices between the two, but it is important for later. Uh, one thing to note about Red Bend, they are heavily promoting SCOMO for automotive ECU updates. A small uh, picture of Red Bend enabled devices. Now this picture may not be up to date, but we found it on their website and thought it'd be a pretty cool thing. So, rise of the control protocol. Uh, detailed analysis, we're gonna go talk about the network design and communications. So, pretty much uh, what happens is when the carriers want the devices to communicate, they will send typically a WAP push to the clients. WAP push hits the SMS gateways, WAP gateways over the networks to the client. Depending on the, t the actual content type, it will you know, more or less wake up the client, tell it to connect back, or actually do configuration management. Uh, we'll go into that a little bit more later, but it's actually fairly simplistic in the in overall architecture. Um, it's when it gets into the nitty-gritty that's a little bit 
more interesting. Okay. You want to talk about some security? Go for it. So I'm going to hand it over to Mark to talk a little bit about security. Uh, that standard in. Do you have it there? Um, so the the standard uh, described some uh, some security uh, had the security uh, standard. Um, so the OMDM security uh, 1.2. So they had a mutual authentication required um, with Digest or HMAC MD5. Um, uh, this, this is based on a secret and a client ID. Um, it also requires a transport uh, layer authentication uh, if, the, um, uh, if there is no, um, so basically, so if there is no um, uh, transport layer authentication, each request must be authenticated, I'm sorry. Um, what also is uh, optional is the uh, integrity and the transport layer encryption. So uh, this protocol um, was designed to be mostly secure, I guess, for the uh, authentication part and the, um, the other components are optional. So uh, it was kind of the, the choice of the uh, the, the implementation to, to have those uh, features. Uh, okay. Take back over. So, we're going to talk about a few of the different initial over the air payload types. So, we have three major types. One, what's called a network initiated alert. Pretty much, it is a very small set of data that just wakes up the client, tells it, phone home. We have another one called DM Bootstrap. Uh, more or less on certain devices, this allows the carrier to completely push its own config at any time, anywhere, uh, and it's used to just configure the client. Then we have what's called CP Bootstrap, which is a harken back to OMA CP days. It also can be used to reconfigure the client. Though we found most carriers, at least in the US, are not using DM and CP Bootstrap, except for one. But, so here is an example of what an NIA payload looks like. More or less, it's just broken up into different PDU chunks. You know, we have version, UI mode. UI mode's kind of interesting. So in UI mode, that's where you do define if you alert the user to its presence. There are three different configuration settings, and one is alert user, other is completely quiet. Goes into session ID, the length, pretty standard stuff, server identifier, also there's the digest, which Mark kind of talked about a little bit earlier, um, the different kinds of authentication, so you didn't include the digest in there. And it can be delivered on just about any kind of bearer type, so that includes uh, standard GSM to CDMA, um, LT, you name it. Anywhere, you know, I'll, you can do it over OBEX if you want. Okay, now we have DM Bootstrap. So we're not going to do CP, but figure we'll go into DM Bootstrap a little bit. Again, it is used for initial device provisioning and reprovisioning. You can see the binary representation. It's called WBXML. Uh, and then the SyncML representation is what we just converted it back to. Make it a little bit easier to understand. So we will now hop into client side analysis. OK. So let's talk a little bit about how the OMA DM clients actually run, what happens with them. So, server will send more or less a WBXML payload to the client. Clients have what are called a DM tree. You can kind of see the example up there. What it is is pretty much like a configuration file combined with uh, like settings as well as what you can actually run. And it's a little bit harder to describe, but uh, if you more or less export different items into this tree, you can then run them. So the URIs that you would export 
example. Uh, like Lamo operations lock. Standard commands, we have get, alert, replace, delete, copy, exec. There's some more, but those are the main interesting ones. Now let's go into some of the nitty gritty of the client side parsing. On the surface layer, it's actually not too bad. Once you start getting into it, then we start seeing the fun stuff. So I'm going to walk you through the different portions of parsing. All starts at cellular. RF comes in, baseband will parse RF data, you know, whether it's WAPs, PDUs, uh, IMS, whatever. Baseband will then pass that to user land, um, either via an AT or QMI uh, type connection. Usually it'll pass data and the metadata around that. OS then reparses that data. So it has to figure out, okay, baseband tells me something, I need to verify it, who do I send this to? Um, in Android, Android system core would typically do that. It gets the data from the real. Uh, then we'll send an intent to whatever OMADM client you have on your device. And on iOS, it all comes into Com Center. Com Center then passes some information via Mac port, or Mac port and XPC to something called DM Helper. From there, we have two different package types or payload types. Package zero we'll start with, which we kind of talked about a little bit earlier with the OTA bootstrap mechanisms, so that's like DM bootstrap or NIAs. Uh, it goes down into WBXML, gets decoded to SyncML, then finally down to DM bootstrap and whatever sub DTDs. So what sub DTDs allow it to do a bunch more things that weren't built into the original client. Then once the initial over the air payload has been delivered. It uh, goes into package one plus. From there, we hop into transport layer. Now it gets a little bit easier to play with because uh, most of the transport layers are HTTPS based. Uh, so, more or less, WBXML over HTTP. And that'll usually be shot up back to whatever carrier network and back to the carrier servers. Under that, it has SyncML, your base OMA DM DTDs, as well as sub DTDs, such as like dev info, meta info, TNDS, et cetera. So let's talk a little bit about our testing and tools. So talk about our cellular testing hardware. We are big fans of Nano BTS and the OpenBSC project. It is really, really good code. Uh, hard to describe how clean that is. It has an awesome built-in SMPP interface. So if you want to do anything with WAP or SMS, definitely recommend it. Also have a USERP B210. Uh, not very good if you want to be pushing heavy amounts of odd data through it. You'll have a lot of stability issues, whatever. Um, and then femtocells. Them to cells are really fun. So go into some more. That's pictures of part of our lab uh, and some of the devices. We have a couple of fem to cells there, the usurps, our nano BTS, which we are currently running. So again, please turn off your phones. Uh, about half of our test phones are there. And we have some other ones that we had to censor out right now. So uh, testing tools, identifying control clients. So let's talk about how you can identify if your phone has this. On iOS, profile different services that are communicating with Com Center. So that would, or would require a jailbroken device. I would recommend getting one that you can re-jailbreak a few times. Uh, We'll talk about that one later. Blackberry, a little bit harder. Um, actually, the person who helped me with that is in the room, Ben Nell. He was able to help me figure out how to play in the radio Q CFM bars, which contain uh, some interesting data. You can definitely find what you're looking for there. Windows Mobile, I would say just uh, 
read the docs. They have the most heavily documented protocol or implementation of OMADM that we have seen. But that's also why we didn't really spend much time on it. We figured that if it's that documented, they know what they're doing. Uh, now, Android. Android is a little bit of a pain because it can be anywhere on this guy. Renamed, how it's inserted, they're just, it's everywhere and nowhere. So what we recommend is identify any services that receive WAP data, or raw data SMS, or just SMS themselves. We've seen OMA clients, well, mostly older ones from a few years ago, that actually would receive and take control uh, commands via SMS. Nowadays, mostly other rare types. But uh, also, audit anything with services directly to the real. So real, radio, or any other kind of direct baseband access, usually leveraging the items listed there. So one thing you will notice is Secrel client. Take note of that. OK. So let's talk about embedded devices. On embedded devices, usually just easiest to start reverse engineering the baseband firmware itself. Throw it in IDA, see what you can see. Um, Take a bunch of time, but usually get fairly decent results. I did. It's gotten pretty good today. Um, easy way to narrow it down. Anything that contains WAP, sync amount, or WBXML strings, you can usually find it pretty quickly. If you aren't able to get easy access to firmware, recommend tracing any kind of UART communications. Stick it on to whatever network it's supposed to be on, and just watch all traffic going across UART. If you have to, leverage JTAG, but you start getting into a little bit more shaky area and trying to track down all that data will be a bit of a pain. And BTS-based testing. A lot of these devices, if you stick them on your BTS and configure it the right way, they'll start communicating just like their home network. It's pretty easy to identify when these payload packets are getting shot. You can look at it in Wireshark. OK, simulating cellular environments. Mark, why don't you take this one? Yeah, so um, we, we had to do some modifications on the phones themselves to be able to uh, test more easily. Um, cellular environments are very slow. It's uh, hard to test. When um, you send a lot of payloads, it tends to, um, to create issues, overload the network. You can't read really fuzz easily. Um, so we, we created those tools that um, allow hooking some, fun some specific functions to make the phone believe it is on the cellular uh, environment, whereas it's actually running over Wi-Fi. Um, so basically, everything the phone check to make sure it's, uh, or to determine the network type, um, which is dependent on the application or uh, system-wide, um, are functions that are hooked and um, uh, allow really uh, testing over Wi-Fi and uh, sending heavy payloads. Um, we also had a few tools to uh, fuzz, uh, to fuzz the application via WAP messages um, without actually using a cellular environment, without even using Wi-Fi. So we were just uh, sending WAP messages from the application itself to, to itself or from another application to the application so that we, can, we could really simulate uh, the, uh, the, the, the exact same thing as uh, uh, what the application would receive when, they would, uh, when it would uh, receive a, a WAP message. Um, so we also used uh, a few tools to, uh, to, trust, to trace uh, system applications. Um, so this specific tool that you can see here, Android Tracer, uh, is based on the uh, Interspy Android. Um, it's by the, the default behavior of the, the original tool was just to test uh, all of the different um, security sensitive APIs, monitor them, make sure the calls are secure, make sure um, they don't do any uh, sensitive, they don't do any um, things that could compromise the security of the application. Um, and so we extended that to be able to trace uh, application in depth. So we added uh, a call graph with uh, different uh, ways to profile applications. So basically all of the um, calls the application makes are listed. You have uh, different layers um, that are displayed within the graph. 
and uh, it's really, really helpful for doing reverse engineering. So we run that uh, over all of the applications on the device, all of the system applications, everything. And we try to see the different interactions between the applications. Um, in addition to that, we added features to, to log as much as possible, have it run all day to, to make sure we, we got everything the uh, applications on the device were, were doing. Uh, so this specific application uses uh, uh, Exposed and CDI Substrate. So those are two hooking frameworks. The uh, original application where it's based off only used uh, CDI Substrate, uh, but the, the it tended to not work very well on some devices. So we ported it to Exposed, and we now use both uh, of them, uh, which is uh, really powerful. Some of the features uh, CDI Substrate can can miss or have bug with, uh, Expos can compensate for that and the other way around. So it was uh, really useful to, to do that. Okay. I'll take back on. Okay. okay. Let's, Let's talk, talk about, about some actual attack, attack platforms. platforms. Um, so, so just standard, standard cellular, cellular network, network attacks. attacks. You know. These are kind of your run of the mill everyday attacks. Luckily, uh, in the US, you're going to be pretty much protected. Worldwide, you might have a little more issues, but um, kind of different attacks that you might run into. Device to device WAP push. Pretty standard. Send a WAP from one device to another, you can do it with apps. Uh, now you have to know what to send, but um, it can definitely be done. Uh, third-party third WAP push interfaces. interfaces. These are interfaces that carriers provide to third parties, say, to send out any kind of WAP message or SMS, like these huge SMS gateways. Most of them have been shut down, but not all of them. Uh, again, U.S. carriers, safer from. Worldwide, you want to turn this off. Uh, no, MTAM, that's a bit of a different beast. We're talking uh, devices, devices without phone, phone numbers. numbers. They, they don't, don't have, have standard SIM card setups, setups. So, so they don't, they don't really, really need a uh, phone card, e uh, uh, cell phone, phone number either. either. They, they use UDP. UDP. You can literally, literally send, send these devices, devices UDP packets, packets to activate, activate them. them. It's pretty much like, like a WDP over UDP. UDP. Interesting, Interesting stuff, stuff, but. but. Now, now LTE, LTE, that is a different beast in itself. Completely new style network designs. You know, we have IMS, SIP. They're like big data networks. Used to be kind of cellular style. Now it is more or less voice over data. The whole layout is a lot more like the, you know standard wired networks or the internet. Um, you know, there's a lot of new attack surfaces there, and there's going to be a lot to keep an eye out for. So, so let's go, let's go into, into our favorite, favorite stuff. stuff. Rogue, Rogue base, base station, station attacks. attacks. Pretty much because we do not test on carrier networks. We have respect for them. We only do our testing on base stations. So these are the kind of different attacks that can happen with someone with a base station, which we have a few of right here. Uh, more or less, something interesting we found is our old 2.5G base station can attack a lot of y'all's high-end global LTE devices. Even if the home network was set to LTE CDMA, found by jamming the LTE and CDMA frequencies, we can get the phones to drop down to uh, 2.5G. More or less, that's edge with data. By do, to do that, we have to broadcast weird uh, cellular configs and some interesting neighboring information. Um, they get confused, drop down. The GSM devices, more stable, LTE, CDMA, they start to get a little funny, but uh, if you work fast, it doesn't really matter. Now, one of the little tips I like to uh, give, be a good neighbor. If you leverage multiple BTSs, you will get a much higher camping rate. That means big issue with anyone who's played with cellular devices is keeping the phones connected to your BTS or getting them there. 
Run lots of BTSs or make it think like you do. You more or less set up your own carrier network, not just a BTS. By feeding the BTS information across this network, the phones get so much data from rogue BTSs that they just think that's right data and they don't really know any better. It's no longer just getting one false BTS base station. Now, we can go into one more area, femtocells. These, if you're willing to get into it, are one of the most stable platforms you can use. They're probably higher tech than what you already have. If you have BTS, unless you have like a lot of money, which we don't, and have LT BTSs, these guys are usually 3G. They can let you play with things like CDMA, uh, whatever networks you need on, they can usually provide an interface to. We like to use them and program our own backends for them, more or less make them think that they are on a network when they really are on ours. So we don't have to mess with carriers. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit more but before we actually go into this. Uh, we've kind of gone into what the carriers have. You know, we gave you a brief overview of the different kind of functionalities. You know, that includes the device management portions of, you know, actual capability on the phone to FOTA times SCOMO, if you also list, direct baseband changes, you name it. Unfortunately, can't say which devices have full feature sets, but carriers have a lot of functionality built in, more or less pretty much an MDM. Not quite, but because I've never seen an MDM that can reconfigure your baseband. So let's actually go into some of these vulnerabilities. Core authentication. So like we talked about earlier, the carriers or OMADM is based on a combination of a device identifier and a shared secret token. So, carrier's implementation uses your device ID, uh, your MEI, or your MEID, which is interesting. Um, it also uses a shared secret token. Now, between that two, two pieces of information, an attacker with direct access to the client can take full control. Now. IMEIs and MEIDs are not public in, or not sensitive information. They are broadcast publicly over more or less cellular network at all times. Uh, the device IMEID or IMEI and MEID is also the client's username. Now, the shared secret token, the secret sauce to the password. Well, it's a combination of the IMEI and a static key across all the carrier devices. So your only security is your IMEI, because that token is hard-coded on each one of your devices. Oh, and the authentication can be downgraded from any high-end back to actually basic, which was not even in the OMA 2.1 standard. It is a throwback to a previous, which means that it's just a base 64 of your username and password that gets sent up. Now, we found some really interesting vulnerabilities in transport and uh, encryption. Why don't you go into that, Mark? Yeah, so uh, when the device uses a uh, transport layer security, which is most funds, um, the SSL can be, um, the SSL veri certificate verification is very weak. Um, the code you can see uh, at the top right is uh, what you can see on a, several, a large number of devices. Um, it's uh, a class that allows, um, that overrides the default hostname verifier for SSL certificates. So basically, um, any, any valid certificate uh, can, be, uh, can be having any uh, hostname and would be able to mine the middle of the connection. So um, they just overrode this. By the, um, they originally overrode this to implement um, certificate pinning. Uh, they had some features where 
um, you would inject your uh, certificate. So this this code is pushed to different uh, platforms, and the uh, each each uh, manufacturers or um, company implementing the code would uh, have their own certificate in one of the directory, and most of them don't. So it defaults to this uh, hostname verifier classes, and um, they validate basically any certificate, any valid certificate uh, delivered for any hostname. So you can basically main the middle uh, most of the connections uh, for the transport security. Uh, in addition to that, they have um, insecure tests, HTTP test server left in their uh, DM tree, which is uh, one of the configuration uh, files they use. And uh, one of the problems with that, uh, whereas in itself, if you just see that in, in a file, you say, so they just left the, um, the HTTP server, the test server, and there's no worries with that. The problem is the protocol is designed so that um, by sending a web message, a web NIA to a device, you can make it choose a certain uh, network. So by default, you have the secure one using HTTPS, but you can also force it to choose uh, this unsecure um, test server uh, that is using HTTP. So basically, by just sending uh, a web message to any device, you would be able to force it to go over HTTP and basically manage the middle of the connection, and then that's it. You can just uh, interact as the, as the server and do whatever you want. Yeah. Um, you have as much control as a, as a client on the device. So well, let me go into that a little bit more. We have pretty much one manufacturer or writer of this code, 90, 70 to 90% market share. They also have somehow test servers on who knows how many devices. With a single WAP push, not your carrier can access the full functionality of your device. That does not require a base station, any kind of man in the middle. All it requires is access to send one WAP push. Oh, and it doesn't even verify the MEID in the WAP push itself. So I'm not sure why one company has this considering they're not the ones managing it, but it's not for me to figure out. Oh, the sample we have on there is from a Google Nexus 5. Android 4.4.4, uh, multiple months after we have done responsible disclosure. This is a XML config file. We are not sure why it's still there. So let's go into abusing some of the standard functionality. So I'm going to talk about some of the interesting things you can do just the standard functionality. Um, one more thing I liked is if you're having to use proximity attacks, so have to get a base station pretty close, you can then do persistent man in the middle more or less reconfigure different device settings to always go over proxies or APNs, different kind of routes that you want. And depending on the device itself, many of these settings will get written into baseband, including into the NVRAM itself, the EFS. So more or less, you factory reset, you still can't get rid of it. Uh, so other interesting portions, you know, it allows us to modify your preferred roaming list, your home networks, anything that you are seeing on your device, we can tell it otherwise. You think you're connecting to one carrier and you are connecting to someone else, you think your route is going through standard gateways, and it is not. And these are usually settings that you have no access to whatsoever especially on lockdown devices. So let's go into another interesting thing we found, carrier customizations. So not only do carriers have OMADM, they have an extra set of customizations in it. Pretty much, we found that it's called Chameleon. It's mostly on one carrier in the US, but provides a lot of interesting functionality. 
such as call intercept. What that does is allow them to redirect any, dial, any number you dial to an application of their choice. So more or less, you can be used as an intent proxy if you wanted to. Um, then it also controls uh, device self-service, which some of you may know, some of you may not. Other applications that are on the device provided by the carrier. Then we have things like voicemail. Interesting. There's some interesting code in there. I strongly recommend any of y'all running Android to take a look at your VMS.apk and tell me what you think. So another interesting portion, inside out baseband attacks. We have a privileged interface to the baseband. We're able to modify the NVRAM, EFS, and other low level parameters. Some of this data is passed via the EMCC or EMMC. That's the carrier partition. So y'all may remember uh, the guy from Cynogen Mod. Wasn't quite wrong, wasn't quite right, but it's kind of on the right track. It can be leveraged both ways. The radio, the radio can write to it and user land can write to it. And it can be used for privilege escalation. Unfortunately, using these different methods, we have multiple devices breaked. Are you ready for demo? No? Okay. So we are going to pass over a couple of our demos real quick until they are completely up and go into a few of the ways we actually obtained code execution without memory corruption. We have four different methods to obtain code execution without memory corruption. SCOMO, software management built in, more or less makes it easy. Not all devices have it, though. Uh, and we have Chameleon. We can just rebrand applications, or rebrand uh, devices with new apps. Intent proxies, pretty much by setting phone numbers and pushing files to the device, we can have it install APKs. And then just standard photo and firmware. You know, it depends on the firmware checking of the device itself. Now, tactical exploitation. That's where it gets a lot more fun. You want to go into some of the details? Um, so the types of vulnerabilities we actually found. On the clients that did not have the built-in functionality to install apps, which actually were a lot of them, we found a fairly significant set of memory corruption and related type vulnerabilities. Uh, buffer overflows, heap corruption, integer overflows, format string issues, arbitrary reads, invalid freeze, and others. I'll let Mark go into our favorite vulnerability, reading memory. Right. Um, yeah, we wanted to talk about the, uh, the specific example, because it's uh, one of the most useful uh, memory each, um, one of the most uh, useful integer overflow we found for su uh, succeeding uh, uh, code execution on most devices. Um, so this is, a, uh, this is an arbitrary read. Um, the, uh, this code you can see uh, on the right is uh, the code that parses the uh, WB XML payload, uh, which can contain numbers. And uh, one of the functions that converts numbers into like uh, a normal integer for, for the program, because they are like a, uh, they have a different uh, um, binary representation in WBXML, so there is some conversion. Uh, so the convert number, the convert number uh, translates this uh, this number, and in this specific case, uh, this number is used to reference a string within uh, one of the string table as the format accepts. So that's uh, to facilitate the um, to avoid uh, more or less the duplication of strings. So you basically just have a, a reference, basically an offset of of the base of the string table to the string you want. To, to use. Um, within this specific uh, code, uh, when they retrieve the number and you have a malicious payload, you, you can see uh, an integer overflow um, within the, at the middle of the, the function here. So they don't verify the, uh, um, if the number is uh, negative, for example. So this is an integer, sign signed integer, and uh, you can wrap around and you can bypass uh, the first check that you can see here. And um, the, the, the data that you can read uh, out of memory from the base of the, this, uh, this buffer 
uh, will be returned to you. And uh, you can actually inject uh, a lot of these uh, arbitrary reads within one payload and read most of the memory that is uh, lower than you, lower than the buffer. Um, Okay. So um, we wanted to talk also about some uh, some issues we found, uh, at least some some weaknesses we found while we were um, testing and while we were doing the uh, the, the proof of concept and the exploits. Um, some of the things we we found and that we used is that um, so for example on iOS um, the memory large so um, the malloc on, on iOS uses uh, three different regions uh, tiny small for like uh, lower than 15 or 16 uh, kilobytes and uh, they have one uh, region per CPU so basically have a lot of different regions for only uh, one process and uh, it's hard to to know where you can be on the heap and uh, it's hard to target specific memory regions However, the malloc large region is always allocated uh, at a similar place, uh, and the memory allocation is relatively linear. It's also close to a lot of uh, interesting data structures, as well as uh, most of the stacks of the program. Uh, in addition, we found other different things uh, related to, to memory protection that don't actually work, uh, that the compiler adds, but it doesn't actually uh, prevent any uh, anything, because there are, there are some issues in the, in the way it's done. Um, yeah, we don't we have a lot of time, so I'm going to go through the next one. Yes. Read it. Quick. All right, so we're going to talk about how we actually changed uh, some of the issues to obtain code execution. Uh, the first step, I guess, for, for this uh, attack is to uh, bypass the authentication. So we send a web push. Um, to, with uh, an ME ID that is uh, pushed to our BTS base station. Uh, so the client automatically uh, sends uh, its IMEI to, to the base station, so it's easy to, to calculate the, um, the authentication. And then, then if they use uh, SSL, we can bypass it with a, a valid certificate signed for Anios name or just use the uh, test server. Um, we also found a few different issues while we were testing, but uh, we don't really have time to talk about this in detail. So, um, so, so it, finding the memory corruption vulnerability is, is good. It's uh, especially for uh, low-level um, programs and program maintenance. You can find a lot of them. But actually, bypassing uh, the exploit mitigation techniques uh, implemented by the OS, especially on some specific platforms, as well as compiler uh, mitigations, um, makes it way harder, obviously. Uh, and uh, while we were doing this, we, we found a few uh, different issues and we collected uh, information on how to, to do that better. And uh, especially since the number of platforms, we had to uh, come up with different uh, techniques. So um, in this specific case, we found uh, ways to find the stack easily. For example, on iOS, uh, I already mentioned it, the malloc large region is allocated close to the stack. And um, there are ways to more or less um, uh, do heap grooming, so more or less you, you send requests that are actually going to allocate uh, massive uh, regions. Sometimes um, you can test requests that will leak data and that will allow you creating holes. So you can basically um, allow your buffer to be wherever you want. Uh, and wherever you want, close to a stack. Most of the stacks uh, on iOS, at least uh, within this program, at least were uh, containing cookies a bit all over the place, and uh, they were mostly at the same location. So we were able to jump on them uh, pretty easily. Uh, for Android, uh, the issues we uh, the issues within the platform we found were uh, ISLR was was pretty weak. Uh, we were able to jump on specific regions that were always more or less allocated at the same place due to the size of the, the buffer that was there. Um, and we also found ways to find code sections. The program had a lot of pointers, function pointers, and uh, we are able to map them back to the original, um, to the base of the, the, for example, on iOS, the shared cache. So then we can uh, continue the exploitation. So I am going to change this over to our VTS to actually uh, show you a demo, because we are just about out of time and haven't gotten to do are any of the demos yet, so we would like to at least show us one. Okay. 
So this is actually, I think, our favorite demo. Hopefully it works. We are having some very odd technical difficulties. Now, so our demo device, I will try to pull up. I guess we don't have a way to show it. Oh, well, let's run it anyway. Let's see what we can do. Anyways, we have a pretty much stock iPhone that we are trying to see if we can demonstrate code execution on. And it looks like we might be out of time. Ah. Oh, it's trying to run. Networks are not. Well, looks like we can't do that demo right now. We are getting cut on time. I do not know why it's not connecting. Oh, let's see. OK, well, so we apologize for the technical difficulties that we've been able to display. Um, appreciate you coming by, more or less.